<laughs> Are we live? I've gotten a thumbs up. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Seeing some familiar names. Oh, you guys are just jumping in like it's hot. It's great. Happy. It's Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. This is exciting stuff. Um, any Vish? Marcel, do you have any dad jokes while we wait for a couple people? Well, I was just going to comment on how you're the queen of cold opens. <laughs> um, you just. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Pause the dramatic effect. The script for this is. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm going to make it up you read as it, I you go. think that can't be right. And then you see it in action. And Colleen, you really bring the script to life. You, you, you transform it in a way that Thank it just, you. you can't, you can't read it off the page the way that you, you do it in real life. So. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We'll, well, thanks. <laughs> so nice. Look at that compliments, everyone. Oh, hello, hello, my friends. Hello, my friends. I've missed you since last week. Um, oh, here's something. Uh, the community sessions on Friday are still going. I had to extend the invite so it doesn't appear in your calendar anymore. So uh, I'll be sending out the community session email later today. So when you go and see it, make sure you register again because then it'll appear in your, your calendar for the, the rest of the year. That's my, that's my plug. Uh, anybody here, their first time joining us for workshop number three? Anybody? Who's late to this profitability party? It's profitability okay, party. Sue and ever. Daniel, you are some newbies. Welcome. We're getting to the good stuff. This is my first time ever. Freddie, uh, Evan, what's up, my friends? Welcome to the party of profitability. Yep. Yep, Edwin, nice to see your face. I mean, I can't actually see your face. I can only see your name. Hi, how's it going? Great. Okay, we'll wait a couple more minutes. Um, if you have been here before, have you implemented any of your learnings yet from the first two workshops? Mm, good question. Jason, this is the a chat. BYOB situation, so. Jason, 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 I got water, caffeine, talked to my accountants and started rearranging accounts. Well done, Jack. Nice, Jack. Anybody else? Oh, Cody says Brandon made all of us finally make our own accounts. Uh, great, great, great. Wasn't a table the first two. No problem, Victor. They are recorded. Uh, Vish, uh, maybe he'll share a link uh, where they are located in the community a little bit later. That way you can go back and watch them. Uh, let's see, learned a lot and implemented some. Edwin, what did you implement? I'll take shirt. I don't know what that means. I'll well, take shirt. Really shirts, Colleen, you didn't catch. Are, are we? Yes, New we need. were voluntold in the chat that uh, Vendasta has oh, given away t-shirts now. Oh, cool, cool, cool. You know, I have so much Vendasta swag. I could probably just give it to you. Here, an extra small, small, right? Yeah, cool. I just want to say I'm really pumped at how many people went and talked to their bookkeeper accountant after the last session and actually actioned some of these changes. That is really, really cool. So great work, everyone. Yay. I have no Vendasta swag. I blame Colleen. Don't blame me. Blame your, who, who do you work with? Is it Adam or is it Jeff Liable? I forget. The other Colleen. There's no other Colleen's. Come on. One and only. My name's really not popular. So if you actually know another one, I'm very impressed. Okay. Shall we kick this thing off. I think we've waited about four minutes or so. Spelled with a K, Jason. No, it's not. Okay. I'm excited. We are going to kick off workshop number three. That was like a hype, everybody. So welcome to Vendasta workshop number three, taking control of profit margins. Oh, next slide. Why didn't that work? There we go. So our agenda today, um, Marcel's going to take us through the presentation, and then we're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A. So 
we all, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there is a Q, oh, there is a Q&A feature inside of Zoom. So it's right next to the chat button. Click in there and that way um, the team who's moderating the questions, we can see it a little bit easier. So questions in the Q&A chat, I may miss your questions. So Q&A, is that the one that says Q&A? Yes, Jason is the one that says Q&A. I like where your head's at. Uh, so Marcel, he is the CEO and co-founder of Paraquito, a company dedicated to helping agencies measure and improve their profitability by stream not streamlining their operations and reporting systems. He's also the fractional COO at Goldfront, an award-winning creative agency in beautiful San Francisco, one of my favorite places. And he's working with brands like Uber, Slack, Keep, and more jazz hands. Everyone community session, jazz hands, uh, as well as the strategic coach at the SaaS Academy by Dan Martell, uh, the number one coaching program for B2B SaaS businesses in the world. <sighs> Fireworks. Uh, myself, my name is Colleen McGrath. I'm the senior manager of community here at Vendasta. And it's my absolute pleasure to be uh, your host today. So, Let's see if I can change my slides. There we go. <clears throat> all of this, all of our recordings, everything you can be found in the Conquer Local Community and Academy. Uh, Vish will be dropping that link, www.academy.conquerlocal.com. Um, that is where you will also find the recordings from our previous workshops. Check it out. We have a podcast with our CEO, C C O Jeepers. Chief Customer Officer, CCO, uh, George Leith, our academy, there's a bunch of learnings in there, and the community, where I usually hang out. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and toss it over to Marcel. Thank you, Colleen, for that my another pleasure. wonderful introduction. I'm going to try, try to drum up the same energy, keep that going throughout the session. Uh, welcome, yes. everyone, to part three of the six-part series aimed at teaching everything that you need to know to measure and improve the performance of your agency in as simple and as cost effective a way as possible. So if you weren't here for the last two sessions, as Colleen mentioned, there will be recordings in the Vendasta community where Vish has just posted a link to go and access. There's also a little area in there where we've been doing some Q&A in between sessions. So if you have some questions that emerge throughout this session, or if you go back and watch the replays of the previous sessions, and there's some things that haven't been answered you're welcome to go in there and post those questions. And I'm popping in a couple of times a week to check that out and make sure that you all have what you need to go forth and do the things that I'm teaching here so that you can be more profitable, be more sustainable and continue to support the backbone of our economy, which is the small businesses of North America and beyond. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into the presentation. I'm going to be drawing on my slides and uh, just know that my handwriting is terrible. So quick uh, recap for everyone, again, that, that hasn't been here before and doesn't know me. Um, all the things that Colleen mentioned, but my primary focus is helping agencies measure and improve their profitability at, at Paraquito. It's the only thing that I do. And I'm just a complete and total nerd. I love numbers um, for fun, literally for fun. Like I'm watching the uh, F1 documentary on Netflix. What's it called? So anyway, I'm watching this and like, the first place that my head goes is like, I want to go look at the financial statements for McLaren. Cause I'm just curious about like what the financial statements for a luxury car company looks like fascinating stuff. I looked at Facebook's financials the other day too, just for fun. So this is me. I love this stuff. I love business. I love business modeling. And if I'm not talking about business or um, involved in business, then I'm probably watching documentaries about it or annoying my girlfriend slash fiance, soon to be wife with all this nonsensical talk about business. So um, I get to do this a lot, which is talk about business. And this is no different. I appreciate Mendasa for having me here. And I hope that everyone will get some value from this session. And just to recap what we do at Paraquito, we're dedicated exclusively to helping agencies measure this stuff and build the ultimate reporting system so they can actually get the answers that they need uh, in real time, regardless of what kind of tools or systems they're using to run their business and regardless of what kind of services they build uh, or sell and how they price those services or measure or don't measure their time. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, head to paraquito.com. Everything that you need to know should be there. And without further ado, uh, I want to 
recap what we've talked about so far on the first couple of calls. So the first call was really kind of an overview of agency profitability and some of the high level formulas, ways of thinking um, that we are going to be covering in more detail over these sessions. On our previous session, we then got into core financials and we essentially talked about what are the four key metrics that we absolutely need to be measuring inside of our agency and what are some simple tweaks that we can make to the financial reports we are already getting from our accountant or bookkeeper to get more value from those and really understanding how to benchmark those metrics and understand what's healthy and what's not and how to think about balanced health on the profit and loss statement for our agency. So uh, we're going to be referring some of the metrics that we talked about in there. I'll try to recap those as we go along. But again, you can go and access the replay to that um, by joining the Vanessa community. Today, what we're going to be talking about is some additional metrics that we can use to really zero in on our earning efficiency and our delivery margin, to be more specific, in between when we get financial reports. Because here's the problem with financials. While they will always be the most precise and the most accurate measurement of performance in our business, because our accounting tools should be the source of truth for the final figures about our business, the problem is accounting is slow and expensive and generally retroactive in that we usually have to wait until the end of the month or most of us 15 or 20 days after the month is over to figure out how that month went. So we're almost two months removed from the actual uh, time period that we're trying to measure when we're using financial statements. And so as much as they are more precise and more accurate, they're far more expensive and they are far more of a lagging indicator. And what's more is that if we want to start getting more specific, so it's one thing to say, how did the agency as a whole perform in a given time period? But if we want to start asking questions about specific clients, specific projects, maybe even specific phases or milestones within different types of projects and start to see patterns and compare those things, it is tremendously expensive to start moving towards project-based or even more granular-based accounting. And for most of us, it's just not something that we are going to have the resources to to do, especially in a timely manner in the short term. So what I want to talk about today are what are some really simple and inexpensive ways that we can get measurement on a much tighter time horizon and at a much deeper level of granularity in our agency without it taking up a ton of time and resources and without us having to wait a long time to get those results. And so we're going to talk about the two levers that we can use. Number one, measuring earning efficiency. And we'll talk specifically today about average billable rates, which is one of my favorite metrics for agency profitability. And we're also going to talk about utilization, the most misunderstood and poorly used metric in the agency space. Today, I'm going to talk about how to use it the right way and how to use these two numbers together to basically get a barometer for our profitability on sometimes as, as often as a weekly basis so that we, we really can use these two numbers to steer the business 80% of the time. And oftentimes the profit and loss statement ends up working itself out if we just make sure to keep these two numbers at a healthy balance. So that's what we're going to cover today. If that sounds interesting to you, if you want to learn more about this, give me a little yes in the chat, maybe a fire emoji, some words of encouragement. Um, but if this sounds uh, totally useless, then I can just bounce and go eat some snacks and take this time back. Brandon is in. Sue says, yes. Evan is ready to go. Hashim says, yeah, fire, boom, explosion emoji. I'm not really sure what that is, but it's good. I like it. There's some energy in it. Colleen's got a fire emoji. Michael, thank you. Jason, all right, we're going to do this. You've convinced me to humor you with this. So we're going to talk first about how to measure earning efficiency. And there's really two common ways to do this. We talked about delivery margin on the last session, which, you know, your accountant might call gross margin or contribution margin, right? There's lots of different names for this, but essentially what is the margin on every dollar of uh, revenue that the company earns? And so of course, this is the most precise way to measure this metric. And if we recall from the previous session, the formula for this is pretty straightforward. It's AGI minus delivery costs. And as a reminder, AGI is our agency gross income, which is our revenue minus all of the pass-through expenses or revenue that doesn't belong to us going to things like ad spend or print budgets or white label contractors. It's what's left over that we actually need to earn with the time that we spend managing that client or getting deliverables done. So AGI minus delivery costs divided by AGI. That is gonna give us our delivery margin. So to give you an example of this, if we had, for example, a project that had a um, million dollars in AGI and we spent $400,000 on delivery costs, then we would have a delivery profit 
in this case of $600,000, which would give us a 60% delivery margin. So that's a practical um, application. But again, the problem with this is um, it requires quite a bit of input in order to do this in an accurate way. Usually we need to rely on our financial data for this. And we've already discussed all the reasons that that's slow and expensive and not ideal. So what we can do instead is use a slightly less precise metric, but that's, I would argue, equally as accurate or very close to as accurate, but substantially less important. And this is something that I can come back to and talk a little bit more, but is a concept that I'm very, very obsessed with, which is the difference between precision and accuracy and the trade-offs we often make between um, like spending way more time and energy than is required, trying to get a little bit more precise, even though it doesn't actually help us get more accurate at all. And the cost is not relative to the benefit. So anyway, I digress. That's delivery margin. So what is average billable rate? This far more inexpensive way to measure this. The formula for average billable rate is simple. It's AGI divided by delivery hours. And the beauty of this metric is you can apply it to literally any slice of your business for which you are able to measure these two values. So you could look at any time period, last week, last six months, last three years, last quarter. And then you can also slice by any subsection of the business. These five clients, this one project, these 10 projects, these types of projects, projects that this team worked on or this person worked on specifically. There are unlimited ways that as long as you have structured your data to give you AGI and delivery hours for um, different variations or different areas of your business, you can measure average bill rate and you can see thereby patterns in that subsection of the business. So when it comes to asking questions like, what is our most profitable service offering? Is it websites? Is it funnel builds? Is it running Facebook ads? You could just measure AGI and delivery hours and then compare those services against each other and get a sense of what your average billable rate is. So to give you an example of this, if we had a project, um, in this case, that was, uh, let's say $15,000 and we spent 100 hours to get that done for the client, then we had an average billable rate of $150 per hour. If we had a project that was $50,000, right? So 50K, and we had to spend 500 hours on that project, then we had an average billable rate of $100 per hour. So you can see here, this also helps us kind of overcome this bias that we tend to have where, uh, you know, I get this answer all the time. I ask people, hey, who's your most profitable client? And then they just point me to the number that's the biggest which is obviously that's not the most profitable client that you have. The most profitable client that you have is the one that requires the least amount of input or the least amount of delivery cost to earn a dollar of revenue. And so we can see here that while this project is $50,000, much larger project, it's substantially less profitable than the smaller 15K project. These are the kinds of insights that average billable rate can get us extremely inexpensively because it requires two pieces of information that we often have the moment that we set up a project. We have our sense of AGI. And then, you know, depending on how often our team is filling out timesheets, we could on a daily basis be updating this value. So this is what I love about average billable rate. And here's what's more. If we understand what our average cost per hour is for that given segment that we're measuring, then we can run the delivery margin calculation and get a sense of what our delivery margin is in that section. So this actually becomes a really good proxy for delivery margin. So to give you an example, if I know that uh, on this 15K project, it's a website build, my average cost per hour is, let's call it uh, $42. So average cost per hour is $42. And I know that for this other project, that's 50K, I've got an average cost per hour of, I don't know, let's say it's a little bit less, $38 per hour. So if I run this formula, AGI minus delivery cost divided by AGI, uh, which in this case, we would use average billable rate minus average cost per hour divided by average billable rate, then we can get a sense of what is my delivery margin on each of these various services. So for the first one, I'm just doing this math in real time. It's 150 minus 42 divided by 150. That gives us a 72% margin. That's great. Good job team on that. I love it. And then the other one is hundred minus 38 divided by 100, which gives us, oh, that is not the right math. 100 minus 38 divided by 100. That gives us a 62% margin. So again, you can see here that even though the average cost per hour is lower, 
Um, the average billable rate relative to the average cost per hour means that this top project is far more profitable, 10% more profitable than the larger 50K project. So mm -hmm. this is my case for why most of us, we should be looking at delivery margin on our profit and loss statement when we get our financial statements mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. But if we want to be looking at this on like a weekly, bi-weekly, like a much tighter cadence, average billable rate and using average cost per hour and getting a directional insight into profitability is by far the most cost-effective way to get this level of insight and start triangulating how profitable we actually are on projects, clients, or different time periods. Is this making sense to everyone? Give me a yes or a thumbs up in the chat if you are tracking so far. Nicole, what profit margin should we be aiming for? Great question. Um, so on the profit and loss statement, so profit target. And we will go into more detail on this in, a, in uh, the session five, I believe, where we talk about pricing and scoping, but our profit targets. On the P&L, we're looking for 60% or more delivery margin. Delivery margin, generally. To be honest, if you're, set, if you're north of 50%, you're probably doing fine, but 60%, you're, you're super, super healthy. So I would say 50 50% plus delivery margin, ideally 60%. And there is some nuance to this because part of this comes down to what kind of overhead you're running in the business. If you're spending consistently 30% of your AGI and overhead, then you probably want to have closer to 60% uh, delivery margin. But if you're running very lean overhead, you're consistently closer to 20%, then you can afford to have a lower delivery margin. So at the end of the day, the question really is, what is our target for net profit, it should be 25% or more. And then what is our overhead look like relative to our agency gross income, which should give you this, the idea of like, what does our delivery margin actually need to look like at an agency basis on a project level, project level, we want to set target 10 to 15% higher to compensate for basically the loss of efficiency that's going to come from gaps in utilization, the fact that you're not going to hit the budget perfectly on every project, you might over service some, you might have to discount some, you might mess something up and have to refund a client, right? There's going to be usually a bit of a gap between what happens on a per project basis and what happens on the PL. So in my example here, if I want to hit, uh, let's call it a 60% delivery margin on my profit and loss statement, I probably want to be targeting 70 to 75% when I estimate a project. And if I'm consistently hitting 70 to 75% on a per project basis, then I should end up comfortably in that 60% range on the profit and loss statement. I hope that answers your question, Nicole. And thank you everyone, Freddie, Michael, Vish, Victor, for the encouragement. I'm glad that this is resonating. So this is kind of the first metric for uh, measuring our profitability essentially on a tighter time horizon using non-financial data, data that's not coming from our accounting tool. The next one that's critically important is utilization. But before we get to that, I just want to show you, I guess, a report that you could use to like how this, how this would actually work in practice. So this is an example of how we would use average billable rate to see patterns across our different service offerings. So this would be a report that we might run on a biweekly basis with the team and say, hey, um, it looks like we're crushing it on funnel builds. We're super efficient there. And our website builds, you know, we're not quite hitting the average billable rate target that we'd like to. So what is it about funnel builds that we're doing that we think is unique, that we think is working well? And then what is it about websites that we need to uh, pay more attention to in order to increase the average billable rate? So this is how we might use this number to get an insight into where do we need to spend some time and energy from an operations perspective, or what should we be talking to the team about so we can get everybody involved in the conversation about efficiency. So that's average billable rate. Um, and then again, average billable rate to delivery margin. We can use our average billable rate and our average cost per hour to, again, get a proxy for delivery margin. And that concludes our conversation. Uh, oh, sorry. Was I? Okay. I was looking at this. I have another screen here. Okay, so we've talked about uh, core financials. We've talked about earning efficiency. The next thing we have to talk about here is utilization, because if we just look at average billable rate, we're not seeing the whole picture because we could be super, super profitable on every single project that we do. But if we're not keeping the team consistently busy enough, then we're still going to have low 
delivery margin on the profit and loss statement. What we also have to pay attention to in, in conjunction with our earning efficiency on a given project or client is our level of utilization as an organization. So let's talk about utilization as a metric and what it means and how to calculate it. This is probably the most uh, confusing question that I guess, or people really seem to struggle with utilization. And this is also to me, the dark saber of agency metrics. When used incorrectly, this can be the most destructive metric to your agency and it can really drive bad behavior as it relates to time tracking. So let's talk about all of that stuff and uh, put your seatbelt on because you're going to experience a bit of a rant from me on this. So at its foundational level, what is utilization? Well, essentially it's the measure of how much of the payroll that we're spending is being deployed against things that earn us revenue. That's the basic question. How much time is our team spending doing things that earn money for the company? Basically what that means is doing things to get deliverables done for clients. And then how much time is spent doing other things? running the business, accounting, bookkeeping, filling out timesheets, uh, doing sales and marketing, et cetera. Um, yes, that was a Star Wars reference, Cody. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And you wield great power with utilization as a metric. And so use it wisely. We'll talk about how to do that. Capacity is one of the basic elements of a utilization calculation. So how much capacity do we have access to in a given period of time? Secondly, delivery hours or billable hours. We're going to call them delivery hours, but understand that this is the same as a billable hour for many of you. The reason I don't use the word billable hours is that sometimes we actually need two concepts and the word billable, I think, is problematic because it conflates this idea with whether or not um, an hour impacts uh, how much the client pays you. And we'll talk about why that's problematic in a moment. But the idea here is we have a capacity, of, we have a certain amount of time that's available in a given period. And then we're trying to figure out how much of that time was used to earn us revenue. And generally we have a target. And so the formula for figuring out our utilization is the following. We take our capacity and we divide it by our delivery hours. So as an example, if we had in a given time period, a 10,000 hour capacity, and we spent 6,000 hours on you know, delivery things, then we had a 60% utilization in that time period. Okay. So very simple formula where the confusion starts to happen is in the question of what is capacity and what is a delivery hour, right? What are we including and not including in capacity? And how do we define a billable hour? And if I ask 10 agencies to give me the details on this, I get 10 different answers. And often within the same agency, I ask 10 different people and all 10 of them give me a different answer. And you could probably understand why this is so problematic because if nobody actually understands what the metric means, then you can see how this starts to drive really strange behavior. Um, it starts to get used in the wrong way. And there's just all kinds of misunderstandings that are happening around this. So I want to clarify my point of view on the best way to measure this. And again, coming from the perspective of what is the best cost to benefit um, in terms of complexity in this metric, precision is metric versus the insight that's going to get. So starting with capacity, what's included in capacity? My argument is everything and everyone is included in capacity. So what does that typically look like? For the average employee, this is 40 hours per week for 52 weeks a year, which equals 2,080 hours per year. And immediately what I get pushed back on here is, well, Marcel, shouldn't we be stripping out vacation time and sick time and paid time off and non-billable time? And my answer to that is no, I don't think that we should. And the other question I get is, well, shouldn't we be taking out the salesperson and the admin person and the custodial services person? Because they don't do any work for clients ever. So shouldn't we be taking them out of this equation as well? And my answer to that is no, we should include all of those people and we should include all of this time. There's a whole bunch of reasons why I think that should be true. The first is that if we don't include those people, then we don't see their cost in this metric and we lose the ability to get insight in our utilization calculation as to how our team composition impacts our utilization and our ceiling for how high our utilization can be. It removes the insight of how fundamentally balanced our team composition is and what position we are putting ourselves in with our staffing plan in order to hit utilization. The second thing that it does is it makes it harder to get horizontal impact because if... 
our team composition is changing. And then in different time periods, we have different amounts of holidays, different amounts of sick time, different amounts of paid time off that are taken, um, all these different factors that are kind of externalities to a given time period, then it's very hard to compare one time period to another. And then the third reason, and this is probably the most important one, is the complexity and cost of measuring utilization increases dramatically with every additional data point that you need to precisely measure in order to get this. So as soon as we start including time off, vacation time, sick time, et cetera, into this calculation, we now need to collect all that information every week when we measure this. And therefore it is far more complicated. And my argument here is that the substantial increase in cost and complexity doesn't add much, if any, additional value or precision to this metric that's actually going to help us get insight. And by doing this in this way, we still have the ability to run that more detailed analysis if and when it's appropriate. So the analogy I'll use here is it's like, if I own a really nice suit, unlike Vich, I'm not going to dress like amazingly beautifully every single day when I come to work. I'm more of a t-shirt and pants kind of guy. I just am not as classy as Vish is, right? So to me, it's like, I'm going to pull my suit out on special occasions as opposed to wearing it all the time, because to me, that's impractical. And that's not a slay on Vish. I just, this is really just me being insecure about how much more dapper he is than myself. Um, so, you know, right. Vish is always in impeccably dress. True. So this is the idea with this metric is like, there is a time and a place for this very precise measurement of, okay, exactly how much time did we have and who was on vacation? And those are situational questions, but we want to pull that complexity out when it's necessary, as opposed to carrying it around with us all the time when we measure this metric. So that's why we have capacity as this gross total number. And then the second um, the second metric here is delivery hours. So delivery hours is going to be the, oh yes. And this, that's a good point. I flipped this metric. Um, so I apologize for that. Delivery hours divided by capacity. So these are flipped. Thanks for catching that. Sometimes I move a little too fast through these things. Yes, this is the formula. So, um, delivery hours. Now let's talk about delivery hours. What is a delivery hour? or a billable hour. And again, I ask 10 people what this means and I get usually 10 different answers. My answer to this is very simple. It's any time that is required doing work for clients. Any time that's spent moving a client deliverable forward. Things that don't impact whether or not it's a billable hour. Did it change the price for the client? Was it in budget or was it not in budget? Was it productive or not productive? Does not matter. The only question here is, was this done for a client or for a client project? If the answer is yes, then it's a billable hour or delivery hour. The reason that this metric often starts to get conflated and manipulated in different ways are there's two main reasons. The first is if we bill on time and materials, and then we actually do need this separate concept for whether or not an hour impacts the price that's billed to the client. But when we conflate these two things together, it robs us of the insight of actually understanding how profitable a project was. Because if we just pretend that the additional hours we had to eat on an hourly project that we didn't bill to the clients, if we just pretend that those hours didn't exist, then we're not actually measuring the true cost of earning that revenue. We are not doing a pure average billable rate calculation if we ignore those hours. So you might need, if you bill on time and materials or you bill by the hour, two concepts here, one which is a billable hour and another which is a delivery hour that have slightly different definitions for the times when you've got to just work free hours for the client on this project because something got messed up or the scope was off or whatever the case might be so that you can still accurately measure the cost. The second reason that this number gets conflated often is because we start to try and hold the team accountable to a utilization target. And I think this is the biggest mistake that people make with utilization. I don't see any reason why it ever makes sense to try and tell a team member that they have a target for utilization and try to hold them accountable to hitting it because they have zero control over their utilization. They don't get to decide how much work you sold and resource them against. They don't get to decide how much work gets put on their plate. Only you and your project management team can decide that. And so if we start to hold them accountable to a utilization target, two things start to happen. Number one, they start lying on their timesheets. You've asked them to do that. Basically, you've put them in a position where they have to do that. Because if they're not given enough work to hit a 65 or 70% utilization, whatever the target was, 
but they know they're going to have to have a disciplinary conversation with you at the end of the week. If they don't hit it, then what are they going to do? They're going to keep making the logo bigger and smaller until they hit their 75% target. And you're no longer going to get accurate information about how long it actually took for them to do that work. You now don't have clean timesheets. It incentivizes inaccurate timesheet reporting. The other thing that starts to happen is when you say, hey, Colleen, I'm actually going to pull you off that client project so that you can work on the company website because we, it's really important for us to get that moving forward. Well, then when she doesn't hit her utilization target, she's going to say, well, that's not fair. You asked me to work on the company website. So then we start to see the definition of a billable hour start to skew towards, well, was it productive time? Which is, again, a dangerous conflation for the concept and starts to mess up our calculation and how we apply this to formulas like average billable rate. And so for that reason, we want to make sure that our definition of a delivery hour or whatever term we're going to use for that is clean and pure in terms of was the time spent working for clients or not. And that's it. It's simple. It's clean. And if you want to have other measurements of how productive people were or, you know, these other things like did it impact the billing, create some separate concepts for that and do that at your own discretion. But for the purpose of this metric, that's how we want to define a delivery hour. And that's how we want to define capacity. Is this clear to everyone? Give me a yes in the chat if uh, this is making sense so far and hopefully giving you some permission to make this simpler than you thought it could be. Um, awesome. Appreciate everyone for that. So in this example, we're going to say that we've got uh, 2,080 hours of capacity. And if this person in the run of a year spends 1,400 hours, again, on delivery work, then their utilization in this example is 1,400 divided by 2080 or 67%. Awesome. So let's talk about this situation here, okay? This scenario that we've got where we have a capacity and we have a certain amount of delivery hours. And right now there is this gap, okay? We are below target. This is a problem. What are the two levers that we can pull here to improve our utilization? Well, the first lever is we can decrease our capacity, right? So that the work that we do have is enough for us to utilize the team at the right level. So we, we have to lay people off or convert people to freelancers or whatever. Not a fun situation, but sometimes this is what we have to do. The other lever though that we can pull is we can get more hours, right? If we have more delivery hours, then this improves the ratio in the calculation. However, the important thing to note here is it's not just about spending more time. It's about actually giving the team more work to do because each of those hours has to be at a high level of efficiency. And this is why we never want to look at utilization or average bubble rate by themselves. Because if the team just starts working more hours to earn the same amount of revenue, it doesn't help the business at all. In fact, we're, we're going backwards in this case. It's not improving our profitability. We're not going to make more money because there is no more money coming in. We're just spending more time to do the same thing that we, we could have done before for less time. And what that's going to do is it's going to start to be reflected in our average billable rate. So if all of a sudden we tell the team, hey, we're, our utilization is crappy. I need you to, to hit a 65%. And then they all start lying on their timesheets or just spending more time for no reason. And all of a sudden this project, instead of taking 100 hours, takes 150. Well, now our average billable rate just went from 150 to 100. And now our margin on this just went from, we'll do the math, 100 minus 42 divided by 100, 58%. So we just lost a pretty substantial amount of margin, right? In this case, we just lost 14% margin on this project because we made the mistake of going to the team and saying, I need you to get your utilization up instead of thinking about how can we get more productive work in front of the team to close this gap and, and really make sure that as our utilization goes up, our average billable rate stays consistent. So this is why we always want to look at these metrics side by side. Hopefully that is helpful. So here's an example. We're going to do two more things, example of how this would be reported on, and then we'll talk about some targets, and then we can go to Q&A. So um, this is an example report, some simple math here. We've got two full-time employees, and we have Rochelle, who's a part-time employee. This is looking at a month. They all have 160 and 80 hours of capacity. The amount of delivery hours that they worked is here. The math is very simple, very clean, and this is our utilization for the period, 67.5%. Let's talk about some targets. So um, the first thing I want to start at the bottom and then I'll kind of talk about more specific roles. So at an agency wide level on an annual basis, basically we want to try to be at 
or more. 50 to 6% is healthy. So we want to set up our team composition and make sure that the team is utilized such that at the end of the year, after all the vacation and sick time and everything has been taken, all of that cost has been incurred, at least half of the payroll that we paid for actually ended up being spent earning us revenue, which means that on a weekly basis, again, we want to pad that by 10 or 15%. So we generally want to be targeting 60 to 65% plus for the entire team on a weekly basis. So what does that mean? Well, there's going to be some people who are 0% billable or just a little bit billable, right? So maybe you've got like an admin assistant, maybe every once in a while she jumps in and helps with client projects, but most of the time she's 0% billable. That's okay. There's going to be some people on the team like that. Then we're going to have delivery managers. These might be people who do work for clients, but their primary role is overseeing or managing a team that does work for clients. So generally we're trying to make sure that they're, you know, 35% or more billable. Generally, this would include like account and project managers, although they can be more highly billable, but understand that it's not reasonable usually to expect them to be highly, highly billable and then also manage a team. And then you're going to have peer producers and they're generally as much as possible, 75% plus on a weekly basis. So we're talking 30 to 36 hours, usually a week that they're billable on client projects. Um, which means they have very minimal requirements outside of that to be doing administrative stuff or doing work that is not um, directly attributed to earning revenue for the business. This is kind of the normal week out of 40 hours target, which means that on an annual basis, again, we're subtracting out 10 to 15%. So pure producers, you want them to net out 60% plus delivery managers, usually 20% plus and others, again, it's, there's no real requirements around that just depends on what the role is. But what's important is that we can achieve this, right? So when you run the analysis on your business, if you use, for example, the free toolkit resources that I'll reference here at the end, you might notice that it's like, oh crap, like we, the way our team is set up right now, we, even if everyone hit their targets, we can't hit 50% this year because we're too top heavy. We have too many people who are just not that billable. Um, so like, these are the kinds of insights that you want to make sure that you get when you model your team so that you know that this is possible for us if we're able to actually get the right amount of work in front of our team. So those are some targets around utilization. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just how this formula, how this actually works, how this has an impact on the business. So I know we've talked about this before, but just to recap, small tweaks in these metrics and how they impact the profitability of the business. So let's imagine that in three cases here, we have 10,000 hours of capacity. This is our team. This is our payroll. This is not changing in any of these three situations. Let's assume that everyone's getting paid the same in all three of these scenarios. In the first scenario, we have a 50% utilization rate and an average billable rate of $100 per hour. So this business is capable of earning in this time period, uh, $500,000, 500K, right? If these things are true, 500K is the amount of revenue this business can earn. If all of a sudden we improve, one of these levers, average billable rate, to $125 per hour. So we can do that by two in two ways, essentially. We can increase our prices or we can just spend less time doing the same work and get a little bit more of that work to keep the team utilized. Now, all of a sudden, the same business with the same cost basis can do 625 k in that same time period. And if none of the costs have changed, that's pure profit. That is a substantial amount of additional profit relative to $500,000. That's, that's a significant percentage, 25%. So you could see here that the difference between break even losing money and being potentially very profitable could just be $25 an hour on average billable rate. Similarly, if we increase our utilization by 5%, which is only 500 hours, which relative to capacity is a very, very small amount of hours, very small percentage. And again, we maintain that $125 hour billable rate. Now we can do 687. $687,000 in that same time period. And again, none of our costs have changed. So you can see how these small improvements in utilization and average billable rate really dictate how profitable a business can be. And I really believe that these two metrics, utilization and average billable rate looked at side by side is basically all you need to pay attention to as an owner to make sure that things are heading in the right direction. And then if you can get a couple true ups on your PL throughout the year, that's great. That's a bonus. But if these things are healthy, then the PL should really work itself out to a large extent, as long as you're not spending way too much on overhead. And most of us are not that fiscally irresponsible. So hopefully this helps illustrate why these are really inexpensive, but very powerful metrics that we can use on tighter time horizons to really make sure that our agency is headed 
in the right direction. So to recap, today we have talked about these two important metrics, earning efficiency and utilization. We've also already talked about core financials. In the next session, we're going to be going into scoping accuracy and how to really figure out if we're measuring things properly and how to start improving the accuracy of our estimation so that we have a strong foundation for agency operations and we can start setting ourselves up for forecasting. And with that, I want to remind everyone that a survey will be going out to ask you for your feedback about today's session. We appreciate you filling that out. And if you would like some free resources to help you start measuring this stuff on your own, you can head to paraquito.com forward slash toolkit, where I've put together all kinds of great things to help you implement what you've learned today. So with that uh, Q&A, I think if we have any time. Uh, I don't have a hard stop, but I know, um, I think these sessions are only 45 minutes and I might be already past that. I don't think he breathes. I don't know if anybody else, yeah, now he takes a big swig of water because I don't think he breathes. I have a blowhole on the top of my head. It so <laughs> helps with this. That's weird, but okay, we'll, we'll go with that. We will answer one question. Uh, the first one that came in, Brandon asks, quick pass through AGI question. Mm -hmm. We have a staff, uh, Aug service augmentation. I'm not sure what Aug means. We have a staff Aug service where we pay the contractor A. We typically, oh, I guessed right, augmentation. Uh, contractor A, we typically them to a client at A times 1.3 minus 1.4, and we keep the difference. We spend little time managing the day to day PMing, project management -ing, of that relationship. Our attention only goes to solving escalated issues, HR issues, and billing slash invoicing slash payroll. Would you, would you consider the contractor's pay pass through our pass through or delivery slash payroll? Do you want mm. me to read that again? Yeah, no, I'm just going to read it myself. So, Brand, you have Good. a staff augmentation service where you pay a contractor and then you mark them up to 1.3 or 1.4 and you keep the difference. And then it sounds like, yeah, you've got kind of a project or account manager in place there to manage the relationship. So this is interesting because um, there's quite a bit of nuance, actually. This, this could be an hour conversation if we were actually working together in a consulting engagement, because there's a lot of factors to consider in how this could be modeled. And there isn't necessarily a clear or perfect answer. But to give you like some initial thoughts on how I would think about this, the first is, are you accountable? Are you truly accountable for the utilization or the profitability of that contractor? And it sounds like in this case, it's not like you're going to the contractor and saying, I need, I'm going to buy so much of your time for X amount per month. And then you're on the hook for going and finding a client to rent them. It sounds like you're aligning risk in terms of the client pays you by the hour and you also pay the contractor by the hour. If that's the case, then I would consider these folks to be passed through because they're passed through. And, and the reason that I would measure them as pass through is because what that essentially means is that if you're charging the client 1.3 or 1.4, your agency gross income or agency gross revenue um, is going to be, and sorry, um, I'll go back to the question there, is going to be the 0.3 or 0.4 that's left over. Basically the markup, that's your actual revenue. Kind of like when Airbnb rents a room out, their revenue is the 15%, not the total amount, right? They're running their whole business on the 15% cut you are running your whole business on the 30 or 40% markup that you apply to this. And your margin is going to come down to how much it costs you to manage that relationship. So the PMing of the relationship, you want to measure your time on that and pay attention to make sure that the markup you're applying to that contractor is enough to essentially make sure you have healthy margins in the management of that relationship. This is um, a mistake I see a ton of people make when they try to run the white label model is they think like, oh, like we basically don't have any cost to deliver this service because we hire contractors to do all of this. And the reality is that that's just wrong. That's your business model is managing the client relationship. That is your primary cost of goods sold and you should be measuring it. And you'd be surprised at how significant those costs can be. But what I will also say, Brandon, is that many of the most profitable agencies we've audited are running this model. So there's a ton of potential to it. I like that you're doing it. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. And I would encourage you to model those contractors as pass-through um, based on the fact that you are aligning the risk in the contract structure and you are not accountable for their utilization or their profitability. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Looks like it did. Thank you, Brandon. Great question. Uh, and I'll answer uh, very quickly Cody's comment. And then Edwin, I will ask you to 
reach out in the community in Vendasta or email me directly with your question because I'm actually not sure what AGR is referring to. So I'd need a little bit more context. But for you, Cody, internal projects are never billable for the purpose of calculating average billable rate and earning efficiency. You might still choose to have a separate metric for that time, but internal projects by definition are never going to be billable. And that is not time that is utilized for the purpose of the metrics that we're talking about today. Um, that's the, the hard and simple answer because those don't earn you revenue. They're an investment in research and development. They might be an investment you know, in sales and marketing or administration, like there might be some, some true legitimate benefit to the investments that you're making in those areas, but they don't directly earn you revenue. And for the purpose of measuring earning efficiency and delivery margin, um, having that time uh, affect your utilization and your average bubble rate would be problematic. So hopefully that gives you some uh, clarity. Okay. And Edwin got his answer. So look at that. Everyone got their answers. Uh, I hope that this was helpful for everyone. Thank you for being here. This was a lot of fun. And I can't wait for the next one where we're going to dig into scoping accuracy, another very nerdy topic uh, that hopefully will be helpful for all of you. Very nerdy topic. I love it. Um, if you scroll up in the chat just a little bit, you will see Vish's uh, helpful links and all where to access uh, the academy, where to access the toolkit, and then where the recordings are taking place. So thank you very much, Marcel, for another amazing workshop. Uh, I think that's it, that's all. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Jazz hands. Bye everyone.